appreciate it. We are going to be done by noon, so we have to keep things moving. So what I'm going to do to start with is I'm going to have each of the people um, just give a, an introduction, a little bit about them and what they do. And um, if you already know them, then I'm sure it'll be a shorter one. Those are members at our church. But uh, I at least want you to get an idea of why they're up there. Our goal was to provide um, a broad spectrum of folks uh, that can share. Um, some of these you'll see again September 30th is our mental health uh, summit. It's a Saturday summit that we'll be having. And so uh, we'll be telling you more about that when it gets closer. But if you want to mark that on your calendar, uh, we'll be registering way in advance because uh, it looks like there's a, a lot of interest already. So we're excited about the opportunity there. So uh, here comes Donnie. We just were waiting for Donnie. That was it. So, um, so I'm, I'll start that way. So Mark, you have the mic. For, oh, you gave it to Mary already. So Mary, we'll let you start things. Oh, and Mary is not being rude, but she has to leave early. She has a grandchild coming over. So that, that I know is a grandfather now that Trump. So uh, she'll be here for a little bit, though. Is this on? Well, they can't hear. We're trying to tape it, too, oh, so that's oh, the big okay. reason. Yeah. Because I am not accustomed to speaking in a microphone. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm accustomed to, a while back, talking to groups of 9th through 12th graders in a high school, teaching them high school English. So I promise not to conjugate any verbs today, <laughs> talk about noun-verb agreement or anything like that. Um, and I really am going to speak in dash, um, because I have my, my grandson Aiden this afternoon. Project Live Up or Perk is what I'm here to talk about, and you'll find some of our uh, literature on the table in the, in the back of the lobby outside. Um, the, the real takeaway I want you to have about Project Live Up or Perk for today is that we are a community coalition. We're a, an all-volunteer group that works with partners in the community to build awareness and to talk about substance use disorder. And that's everything from alcohol to, um, you know, any substance that people use um, inappropriately. So, um, what we're, we just recently had a community summit where we met with a good many of our community partners. The ministerium here in the Upper Cayman Valley is a, is a huge supporter of ours. We appreciate that. Um, to talk about what our next steps are, um, especially after COVID when we all kind of, um, had a, a lot of time to think, but not as much time to act as, we, as we'd like to. Um, so my promise is that you will be hearing more from us as we, as we um, are doing more. One of our big partners is the Upper Perkin with School District. We do some programming with them um, around parent engagement and um, talking to kids about prevention. Uh, this past week at the high school was prevention week. Um, every kid from the high school went home with a sweatshirt that says, please come home safe. Um, Friday was their prom, so that was a nice lead up to prom. Uh, the kids themselves came up with the, the logo, the slogan on the t-shirt, and uh, we helped finance that every kid got one. Um, and then they had programming throughout the week that they did through the kids did, kid generated programming. But that was something that our youth facilitator um, helped put together. So that's one of our big, um, our big partnerships right now is with the school district. We're working right now for school year 23-24 on Red Ribbon Week, which is the week right before um, Halloween in the fall, um, again, where you're trying to get people to be build awareness about making good choices um, and, and building resilience. And then again, Prevention Week uh, the next spring. Just the one thing that we do have that managed to continue through COVID is our recovery group. It meets every Thursday night at the Senior Center. Um, this is a group that has a really good partnership with the Y for people who are in recovery, who come and attend regularly. The Y helps us with free <coughs> membership, memberships for those folks because we know how important um, your physical well-being you know, links to your mental well-being. Um, we are working on, and this is something I'll probably be reaching out to this congregation uh, um, about is we're working on rebuilding our family support group. We've had various family support groups on and off through the, in the valley, but they seem to they seem to rise and fall. So mm -hmm. um, that's that's I think our next big initiative that we're going to be working on. So you'll be hearing more from us, and um, and I really do apologize that I had to to just say hi and, and run out the door, but I very much I was here for the first service and I very much enjoyed it. This is a great congregation, and it and it was. 
just a real pleasure to be here. So thank you. I'm humbled and really appreciative. Thank you. Um, I am still Mark, and I'm still at Access Services. Um, and we are a service provider um, that has a, a number of mental health services that are, are available in, in Montgomery County. We have a mobile crisis program, 24-7 hotline, uh, mobile response. People will come to you in, in the crisis that you have, and that includes uh, mental health crises. Uh, we have um, a big, big educational program, so we go into schools, we talk about suicide, suicide prevention, we talk about mental health, we talk about bullying, um, and so there's, there's a, um, a big thing that we do around community education, mental health first aid, um, the QPR and assist programs are, are educational programs around how all of us in the community um, can respond and to suicide and suicide prevention. Um, and then we have, we have this Intersect program, it's an Intersect initiative, which is really an effort to say, how do we as a service provider bridge the gap? So Ron talked about that false dichotomy, where we say, go, go get a service and come back to us as, as be, be part of our church. And so that initiative, the Intersect in initiative, is say, how do we help people who are standing at that intersection of faith and mental health? How do we, how do we stand in that space with people, both from the community of, uh, faith community side and also from the service side and so um, that's what we do um, there's some information on the back I'm, I'm always happy to talk to people about the services uh, that we provide I want to also just go back to this idea of a brave space because it's bigger than getting a service or helping somebody steering to a service it, it includes that um, but so I'm going to tell you a super quick story and then I'll explain three things that we do, we can do as a congregation to create brave space. Uh, a number of years ago, when I was a leader in the church that I, I used to go to, my, my mom also went to that church, my parents did, and there was a woman in our congregation who had a bipolar disorder that nobody knew about because she just managed it. She had a therapist, she had a psychiatrist, she, had, she knew what to do to manage that, that part of her life. She had four kids, she homeschooled those kids and uh, at some point, someone from a different congregation was talking with her and said, if your faith was stronger, you wouldn't need to be on medication. And so she went through this period of doubt where she felt like her faith was the problem, that her faith wasn't as strong as it should be, which is not true, by the way. That's, that's not a really good way to think about mental health. Um, but she stopped taking her medication, and as a result, she went into a, a manic crisis, which happened in our church, and, and it involved um, emergency personnel coming to our church and responding to her. She was hospitalized for a period of time, and when she went back home, and then she had to start over again um, in terms of her treatment, um, which she did, but it took a while to get back to where she had been. In the interim, she had been homeschooling, but she... They sent her kid, her kids then went to school because she couldn't, she just couldn't manage all of that. And what they said in our church was to some of the women, can you make, can you make meals for, for this family? And so the meal thing went out and my mom, so my mom, remember, she, um, she brought a meal to, to this woman and she answered the door and she said, could you come in and sit down with us and have this meal with us? And my mom said, oh, oh no. <laughs> um, and she had other things that she needed to do that day. Um, and so she, but she called, so she called me up and she said, what am I supposed to do? Like, um, I just thought I was bringing a meal to her. And I said, I, I don't know, mom, except that she asked you. <laughs> and so maybe she needs something. And, and so what can you do? And my mom was recently retired. She said, I could go have coffee with her. And so I said, well, why don't you ask her if it's okay to bring over coffee? And then she called me back. She said, she said yes, now what do I do? <laughs> so she goes, what do we talk about? Like, what are we, what are we gonna do? And I, I said, I, I don't know, Mom, except she wants you to come over and have coffee with her. So can you bring the coffee with her, bring a muffin to go with it? Um, and then I said, I know she reads and you read. You're a great reader. And, and she taught her kids and you were an English teacher. Talk about things that teachers would talk about. Talk about books that that you might have in common. Just have a conversation and see where that goes. So she did, and she called me back, and she said, it was great. We, we read the same books. We're going to swap some books. We're going to get together for coffee again. Um, and so there was a thing. This woman needed some treatment. She needed services. 
and she also needed the body of Christ. Amen. Right? So, um, so there's, a, there's, there's these three things that I think go into creating a brave space, which is what churches have to offer that services do not have to offer. And that's this. Move towards it. When you see something that doesn't feel right to you, move towards it. Are you okay? That's what Pastor Ron was talking about, that we, we are afraid to say that. Are you okay? Uh, move towards it. Sit with it, which means I don't know the answer, and I was scared to bring it up because I was afraid you were going to tell me, John, that you're not okay, and now I, am, I, have not, I don't have any idea what to do, like my mom. Right? So I don't know what to do if you say you're not doing okay. But I'm going to sit with you because I don't have to have all the answers, but I can be present. And then the third thing is go get help if you need to. <laughs> and that's where services come in. That's where other people in the congregation who have lived experience come in. That's where stories like what you heard today, that's where that experience comes in. Go get help if you need to. But we have to do those three things. And when we do that, we create a space where it's okay to not be okay. In fact, we expect that. All of us are struggling in, at some point, and we need each other to go through that struggle. Amen. Amen. Um, I'm Julia. My husband and I have been coming to this church for eight-ish years now. Um, Too long. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, this is why Donnie didn't get to talk earlier. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, you kind of heard a lot of my experiences in what I said earlier, and I took five extra minutes than I was supposed to earlier, so I'm just going to pass this. <laughs> it's about time. Um, I'm just here really to support her, um, although I do have a couple things quick to say. Um, I think that my greatest strength in dealing with mental health, f family issues, and personal issues is the boundaries, and usually that's the hardest one. But using boundaries and sticking to them, usually you have to be, like she said, a little bit numb and callous to certain things. So that is the greatest struggle for me, is being emotionally connected to her and understanding how she's feeling and my family's feeling, but also understanding the boundary aspect. Um, I've worked in the emergency room for almost 10 years here now, so I've seen people that come in that are depressed, I wanna talk to somebody, to people that have actually killed themselves. And so the spectrum is very large. And I think part of that's what made it a little bit more cynical to me, but I'll, maybe cynical is not the correct word, but it has made me understand that the spectrum and things involved as far as drugs, alcohol, promiscuity, or none of that, or family life. Um, the spectrum is, there's so many variables that go into it. Um, also understanding that our system is set up um, for crisis and not mental health prevention and maintenance that is the greatest issue and I think that's the greatest importance of what we're, we're doing here as a, as a church um, with all the resources that we have up here is understanding that this is where we can get our maintenance and our prevention from there are things for crisis that we can do but um yeah I would say for those of you here that kind of feel like you're frustrated with family members you're numb you're callous you just you know want them to get their act together um that's me most of the time, although I'm trying to be humble enough to understand that that's how I am feeling and to let my wife know that I am here to listen to you and my parents and my in-laws and all that. Um, I am here for you and I'm here to listen to you. So just understanding that and um, letting people into your life to be able to help you. Um, I'm Megan. I uh, am a certified recovery specialist for Penn Foundation. Um, they do a wide range of mental health and drug and alcohol services. Um, and being a certified recovery specialist, it's kind of practically a part of my job description to be in recovery. Um, they, it's a certification that uh, you get to like, once you're in recovery, just learn more about how to help others and then you get to, I don't know, have a job for that. So I have that, I'm going to school for social work and um, in between all of that, I've been learning how to serve our community by working at Penn Foundation. So I've had a lot of different jobs there, uh, but currently I'm in the admissions and intake department for drug and alcohol. So if anybody knows anybody who's struggling, um, you know, that's kind of my specialty is how to get started because 
that was definitely the hardest part for me when I needed um, some services and getting started with that because um, it's kind of the hardest part just finding out where to start because you go on Google and it'll be like call 1-800-RECOVERY and then it's like you have to tell them what state you live in or talk to like automated prompts and stuff and that can be really discouraging and frustrating and sometimes people will just be like, mm, I tried, I'm done, maybe tomorrow I'll try again. So having somebody, you know, that now works in the department that was hardest to reach, which shouldn't be the case, but um, I just really needed somebody who knew what they were talking about and um, was able to give me like transparent answers on where to start and not necessarily the correct like scripted answers. So I make sure to do that in my job as well. Um, you know, if somebody, we get a lot of people who call and it's not necessarily the right department. So instead of telling them like, oh, sorry, I can't help you. Good luck. God bless. I just say, you know, well, that's not necessarily what I am here to do. But I do know people who can do that for you. And, you know, in my downtime at my job, if we don't have a lot of people calling that day, I will, um, you know, look up and research some local resources in the area. And there's a lot of things that Penn Foundation doesn't provide, which is hard to believe because I can't even keep track of all of the different programs they have. But, you know, if somebody needed help with like finding homeless shelters or domestic violence resources, I have all of that. And then I have, um, you know, other mental health facilities, other drug and alcohol facilities. If like my facility isn't in network with your insurance or if it's too far away or if it's just not what you want, like if you've been there before and didn't like it, I'm not, you know, a loyalist to my facility that I work at. I'm more interested in making sure that like people in our community get the help that is the best fit for them. Nice. And that's a big focus at my job. So yeah. I really respect them for that is that, um, you know, they keep an open mind that treatment isn't a one size fit all type of thing. It's a very individual process. So nice. even since I've worked there, which has only been since 2017, I've seen a lot of like decrease in stigma and a lot more open-mindedness of like, this may work for most people, but it's not working for you. So let's kind of go against options A, B, and C and be like open-ended instead. So I just, I don't know. There's a lot of things I could talk about, a lot of different rabbit holes I could go down because it's all connected, um, mental health and drug and alcohol and all of that. So. I have personal experience with still needing to like maintain my own mental health, my own, you know, spiritual health and physical health. Like Pastor John was saying, it's a, you know, we're holistic individuals. So we need all of those things to work cohesively to be at our best like balance of wellness. So if you need help finding support for other people professionally, I can help with that. But also if you just need somebody to talk to and like Donnie and, uh, was saying, you know, just somebody who understands the frustrations of that or anything. Um, there's a lot of people in this church that can help with that as well. So I really appreciate that about what we have here. And I'm just really grateful that we get to have a whole Sunday dedicated to this because it's really important. And I think that, you know, we just, like um, Mark was saying, it's, it's not a faith issue. It is a real problem that God is, you know, crucial in getting us through, but it's also something that there should be absolutely no shame seeking out other help as well. So that's kind of just a summary of why I was asked to come up here. So, Thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Tony, and I want to thank Kelly sitting in over there and Pastor John for inviting me here today. I really appreciate it. It's very humbling to be here. Uh, the service was just uh, awesome. The worship, the, the testimonies, uh, the music, and it was just really, you know, touched your heart. Um, but my expertise and passion falls in the physical part of what we're talking about today. So I just want to share that with you briefly because when you said we had 10 minutes, I'm like, no, I need like three hours, <laughs> you know, so we won't do that. Um, when it comes to helping people with their mental wellness, as I like to call it, 
you know, the, I look at four different areas of energy that we have. And the first one is our physical energy. And of course, that is, you know, the quality of our energy. So do you wake up in the morning, do you, do you have energy, you're ready to take on the day, you know, or are you tired and you need that cup of coffee and it just takes an hour and a half to get going. So that's our physical energy. And then we have our emotional energy, right? And that's the quality of our energy. You know, are you happy? Are you living a life that is grateful and thankful? Or are you complaining all the time and feeling down and, you know, not knowing what direction your life is going in? And then we have our mental energy, and that's really our focus. You know, uh, we have a joke in our family that the keys are in the refrigerator because every once in a while I forget to turn the stove <laughs> off or, or something like that. You know, but it's our, our capacity to learn and to understand and to reason. And then, of course, we have our spiritual energy. You know, and that's our, our um, you know, the battle of mental health is more spiritual than it is physical, I believe. Uh, but that spiritual energy being the Holy Spirit and our faith. So when I look at a person who comes into my office and is struggling, and Kelly and I were just talking about this, you know, 90%, 80 or 90% of those people have some type of, some type of gut-related physical problem. And we, you've all heard that the gut and brain have this wonderful connection and that, that the gut is our second brain. Uh, but in reality, for every one signal that our brain sends to the gut, the gut sends four more signals back to the brain. So a lot of it happens right here. And of course, you know, science is, always takes a long time to catch up with, you know, the Bible and our faith, you know. And right at the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, you know, uh, we were told that the Lord created man from the dust of the earth. And he breathed into his nostrils, you know, life. And he became a living being. And when I read that the first time, I was like, wow, okay, that, that's great. You know, I believe that. But then when you think about the science behind it, it's even more remarkable. So back in 1990, they started this project called the Genome Project. And scientists, what were they were trying to do is they thought that for every illness that we have, there's a gene. And if we find that gene, we can cure that illness. So they did this project over about 14 years with an international panel. But this is what they found. They found that our gut microbiome is made up of 100 trillion foreign organisms. Our entire body only has 10 trillion cells. So that makes us only 10% human, <laughs> right? But then it came to the genes. And what they found about the genes is that there was 10 million genes through those microorganisms in our body. And they thought they were gonna find that the human body had hundreds and thousands of genes for all these diseases. But what they found is that we only have 23,000 genes. And the wonderful, the orchestrated uh, life that comes from those 23,000 genes is just unbelievable. Just unbelievable. So that makes the gut such an important part of who we are and our well-being. So when we help people, we focus on the physical, um, but we always take into consideration those four energies, so the mental, uh, the spiritual, and the emotional part of every person that walks through our office. And I think that's how we can help mental health, you know, the advancement of mental health wellness uh, take place by looking at a whole allopathic medicine, and there's nothing wrong with allopathic medicine, but they separate the person into systems. So if you have, you know, you have a heart problem, you go to cardiologist. You have a gut problem, you go to gastroenterologist. You have a mental problem, you go to a therapist. You know, but we can't look at people that way. We have to look at them as a whole person with all those four energies in place. And that's what I think functional medicine does very well. So again, thank you for having me here. You know, there, I did have a slide. I don't know if that slide oh, is up. I don't know if I got it. Um, two things, if, if you want to learn more and you just want to follow along, I have a free Facebook group. It's called Creating Vitality with Dr. Tony. And you could just join that and we talk about health issues all the time. But if you're struggling now and you can't wait till the fall, uh, I have a website, ubwellcenter.com, and you can click on there and have a free discovery call. And we can just have a phone call, 30-minute conversation about what's going on in your life, and I can give you some direction so you don't have to wait till the fall when we'll spend a little bit more time, you know, talking through the details of how we can help you. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <coughs> yeah, go ahead and hand that down. Thank you. This will be the fun part, handing down a microphone. I, I just want to add to what we just heard. Like, 
we are holistic. We're whole people. And also, we're relational. God's, God describes himself as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is a mystery I don't quite get. I just know that it is. But his very identity is relational. His identity is relational. And secondly, for some reason, God decides to do his work in us through each other. It, when I look at myself and I say, well, part of the way John is going to get help from God, that God's going to care for John, is that Mark's going to help him. I'm like, God, you, that's not a good business model. Like, like I know me. And I'm like, why, why would you choose to do that? But God does. And so when we, when we think about helping a whole person, it's how do we be a community that helps a whole person, and how do we enter into this relationally? And that's why it's really important for us to, in the same way we don't separate out um, the head from the heart, from the gut, from the, the, the emotion, we don't separate people out that way. We don't separate out our sense of community and our sense of relationship to people. The person that's struggling next to you is just as dependent on you as their friend as they are on a therapist who can bring something different that you can't bring. But it takes all of that working together to help all of us uh, be well. Amen. Thank you. Well, I have questions, but I want to make sure we give you guys the opportunity. Uh, we have about 17 minutes. So uh, what questions do you all have before I can pull out some that I have in my bag uh, to bring to any of them? You can ask all of them, one of them, however you might want to do that. And we are going to give you a mic because we're taping this, okay? So don't get too intimidated. But there's other people that can't be here that would like to be able to hear this that are serving downstairs and other things. So uh, Jason Zimfer has a microphone somewhere in the back. So who has a question? Over here, Jason. Thank you. I just want to say it's our first time here today, and it's been such a blessing. And we didn't know what the topic was going to be but it touches us and our children, our grandchildren, and our own lives. Thank you. And God is so good because we were in the car like, we don't really want to go today. And it's been a year since we've been in church. And it's just been awesome. Um, the question I have is, does anyone have a resource for how to create boundaries that are biblical, and where do we find that where we don't, we're not inundated with three to 500 page book before we get some answers? We're trying to reach our kids where they are, and it's not easy to do it when we're brainstorming, we're hoping our girlfriends or friends at work can help us, and scripture is wonderful, but we're still trying to plan it out in paper and steps and yeah. Thank you. It's awesome how God brought you here today, by the way. Thank you for coming. But I just love, even in our difficulties and heartaches, how God has this amazing plan to bring us right where he needs us, when he needs us. So welcome to there. Who, who, anybody have an answer for that? Boundaries? Donnie, want to speak? Do you have like 16 books you want to share? I don't have a, re I don't have a resource. I don't have a resource, but I have a three and a five-year-old daughter, and now I understand the struggle as a parent for, and my, my kids, mentally, they're great because they're young kids, they're happy, but I now I understand, you know, when I can give advice to other people and I say, S stick with your boundary, stick with your boundary, and then I sit back and think, if this was Kylie or Madison, and I said, of course, I would continue to let them come home every time. I would continue to support them until the day they die or I die, and so... That emotional connection to your children will never go away, and I, now I understand that. So I think what you're feeling is normal as far as a resource goes. Yeah. Right over here. here <laughs> I can share some, but I think yeah, I would, it, I'd let you. So you're talking also of parenthood, which is a whole animal of itself. As a parent of now adults um, and, and still... still in their lives, I, I, you know, parenting is its own set of things, as as was just said. One of the one of the short resources there's a there's a Brene Brown video. It's called Empathy and Boundaries. It's an interview she's doing with another person. It's five minutes long, but the thing I like about Brene Brown is she says things in a sentence that 
needs a lot of unpacking in my head over time, but it's the thing that I keep coming back to. And the thing that she says about boundaries, she defines it very simply. And it's what's okay and what's not okay. And usually when, I have, when, I, when I'm struggling with somebody, first of all, I know that when I'm pissed off at them that maybe we have a boundary issue. Like I, I, I didn't always know that, but now that I know that, I think what's the boundary issue in this space? I'm frustrated with you, I'm upset with you, I'm angry, I'm about to speak in anger. That then can I pause for a second and say, is there a boundary issue? And what I say to answer that question in my own head is, what about this? What in this situation is okay? And what in this situation is not okay? Because that frames it for me to, to at least know how to start the conversation or what I need to say next. It doesn't mean I do it well. It just means that I'm orienting myself a little bit to that. So again, it's not a huge resource, but I think it's a practical. Say it again and spell the name. It's Brene Brown, B-R-E-N-E and Brown. She does a lot of podcasts. She does a lot of, there's lots of good things that come out of her mouth. But this one is an interview that she does with another person. And, and if you Google Brene Brown, um, empathy. empathy and boundaries. And what she says is when you set boundaries, you can be empathetic with this person for a really long time. But the boundaries are the thing that lets you do that. Um, this isn't necessarily a resource and may not help the men in the room, sorry. But um, I honestly, through the years, have, especially in our marriage, have really defaulted to Donnie a lot um, for the decisions that I've had to make as a family member of some, some of these family members that have mental health struggles. Um, for me, like, I am a type 2 on the Enneagram. I want to help. I want to go. I want to do. I want to give. Like, that is who I am. And I want to fix every situation. Um, and so that in me is reined in by him a lot of times because he's like, no, that's not where our finances are going to go to. And no, we've given to that before and that help has been squandered. And so we are not going to do that again. Or no, we are not going to do that <coughs> until there are other people stepping in um, in a much bigger way to help us channel this so that we are not being destroyed mm -hmm. as a family um, in trying to help take care of these kids or whatever the situation is. So. For me, um, personally, a lot of my, like, and I think that's also very biblical, like, God's design is for me to be submissive to my husband, and so I have, like, reined that in to be like, okay, Donnie has said this about our finances, and so I'm not just going to give the money or drop the thing or whatever without first consulting him and talking about it and where, where can we give, what can we do. Um, it's not cash for us anymore in some of our circumstances because that is not a good thing for the people that we are helping. It's sometimes resources, it's sometimes groceries, it's sometimes going and helping, um, mm. and that's the way that we give instead of just mm -hmm. giving cash to these people. So mm. I don't know if that helps a little bit, but for like not for the men, and then I guess going up from there, like in the biblical sense, it's like God is ultimately who they are responsible for, who he is responsible for in leading our family and just asking for guidance and wisdom one step at a time because every single situation is going to be a little bit different. This time it's money for this. Next time it'll be money for that. So, or and that's just one example. There are a lot of other things mm -hmm. that people that struggle are asking for housing, all the things like. But it's taking those circumstances, mm -hmm. bringing them before the Lord, and maybe even having those conversations ahead of time. Well, they've asked for this. What if they ask for this? What are we going to do in that mm -hmm. circumstance? Um, that's been really helpful for us to just have a really open dialogue about mm -hmm. like. So then when I get those calls, I'm not like. Uh, I'm, I'm usually like, um, let me talk to my husband about it, which is a great default for me. Like, I need to get back to you on this mm -hmm. because I want to just say, yep, let's go. Bring mm -hmm. it, bring him here. Mm -hmm. We'll do it. We'll house him. We'll, we'll do mm -hmm. everything. But that is not what's best for our family unit, mm -hmm. which is now in God's design. I have left and cleaved to my husband. And mm -hmm. now I have a family that I'm responsible to take care of. And that is God's design also. So keeping those two things separate in my mind has been a really helpful thing for me. You can just hold on to it. Um, I will say one book, Boundaries. I think it's Townsend. Is it Townsend? No, Cloud. Henry Cloud, yeah. And yeah, there's two. So that, that could be as well. And I know we have families here who have adult children, children in different stages that have walked through that. So if you have a chance to go and chat with this couple afterwards and just kind of give them, hey, we'd be happy to go grab coffee and uh, chat with you, I know that way as well. So um, hopefully you'll see. If not, I, can, I have some other things I can share with you as well. Good, thank you so much. Who else? Way up here in the front, Barb. 
somebody else back there next time. I want to see how much Jason can run <laughs> before we're. Um, uh, my family is riddled with health, mental health issues. Siblings, my children, my grandchildren. I have a big issue with enabling. Now I finally got to the point where, okay, you gotta knock this off. The boundary thing's big. Um, I have to learn, and this is so hard for me to stop trying to help, because I'm a helper bee. I want to help. I want to fix. And if I can't, then I get so full of anxiety and depressed. But what do you do to stop this? To, I, I feel because my grandchildren lived with me for so long, and they come to me with their issues, and I want to fix it, but I'm not their parent. So my daughter gets so angry with me. And I've learned to just up and leave when I start, you know, mm -hmm. and I can't take it. I just, I just leave. I should have said something, of course, but I didn't. My children, then my grandchildren got upset. And then the text messages back and forth mm -hmm. and stuff, it's just hard. <coughs> yeah. It's so hard okay. to, to step back. Yeah. Don't give advice, just listen. Mm. But that's what you have to do. Mm. Um, otherwise, yeah. I get caught up in this highly tense moments with mm. them trying to explain how I, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's just, uh, it's hard to get it out. Yeah. But so is your, uh, is your question how to, how, to, how to deal with the fact that you can't fix? Is that what you're asking for help Yes, with? and how okay. to step back. Well, step I know back. to step back. I know to leave. I, okay. I do leave now. Okay. But it's yeah. not, I've got to stop trying right. to fix things. That any I any control comments of. on that? Oh, go ahead, Megan. There you go. Um, I can relate to that a lot. Um, I don't have any children or anything, but I've had a lot of friends who, you know, once I began recovering um, and they didn't follow along, it was really hard, you know, to know where do I draw the line that is the line where they know I still love them, but, you know, that I'm not tiring myself out by still helping so much that it's like I never got out of that life at all. Um, so where the biblical stuff comes in with that is God really, really loves it when we ask for wisdom. And I think that's a crucial step, at least for me. I saw a huge change in my life when I was just praying one day and I was like, God, I see it in text that you love it when I ask for wisdom. So here I am and I am asking for wisdom, please and thank you. And I was able to day by day feel that and remember like this is my prayer working and it wasn't even a good prayer. It was just very casual and I was very tired and it still worked. So that's good to remember too. And um, so first and foremost, asking for that wisdom. And then another thing that really helped me in addition to that is my therapist. Um, she's a believer as well. And she always brings up something called the column of responsibility. And I think it's like a legit model so that you can look up and see more examples upon. But just to summarize it quickly, I just would draw out a chart and I would say what's my responsibility what's their responsibility and what's God's responsibility mm. and because I am the type of person who I say well if we bend this in the right way it can all fall in my column <laughs> and then I can manipulate this whole situation and I can be responsible for it and the results will come because I get to do it and that's that's yeah. delusional for me like I I did not get the desired results with that right. thinking. It was just a lot of work with a temporary payoff, and I realized that the people that I would try to help more than they wanted me to would just appease me mm. so that I would go away. Mm. And I worked so hard, and I thought, yeah, that really did something. 
but they were just smiling and nodding and they're like, yeah, thanks, thank you. And they're like, I'm not gonna do any of that at all. Right. I didn't ask for that. So sometimes the way we think people wanna be helped is ideal for us, but it's not ideal for mm. them. So just asking them, what I try to do is what if somebody comes to me and I'm like, oh man, I've been helping this person for years, you know, and I can't even imagine from your standpoint, like grandchildren and children, it's been a very long time, I'm sure. Um, I just ask them before I start giving suggestions, I'm like, how do you want me to help you with this? Mm. What is your goal? Like, what do you need somebody else to do with you? Because mm. I can't do the whole thing for you. I can't heal you. I'm not God. So how can I support mm. you through this? And um, that usually segues into a better discussion that's more clear for both you and for the person that maybe they don't even know what they want. Right. And maybe no one's asked them what they want yet. Mm. They just want it to be gone. But that's, yeah. we all do. So asking them, how would you like help with this might be the first time that they've thought about it. Mm. And that can really be the start of like <coughs> long lasting change, at least in my mm. life personally. And for people that I've started talking to that way, I've mm. seen longer lasting results as well. And, um, you know, I could go on forever because then it's like, then you talk yeah, about yeah. this and then that, but it really is an individual thing. So I hope that right. gives you a yeah. good starting point. Yeah, and Julia has, thank you, Megan. Yeah. yeah, I think I teach CPR and we can't help someone else if we are not well ourselves. Mm -hmm. So like if the situation is not safe, we have to move the patient, the victim. If, if we are not able to do something, we can't help them. Um, I think one thing that just kind of came to my mind in some of our experiences is setting down some clear guidelines with these people who maybe are taking advantage of you in this enabling type of situation and saying, I will not, be screamed at and hung up on again today. And I will not answer your phone call for the rest of the day. I love you, I care about you, I have said all that I could say, you're not listening, and if you're gonna scream at me and hang up on me 25 more times today, I cannot handle that myself. So I know that's been the reality of the situation mm -hmm. for us before, is just saying, I love you, but I need a break. Mm -hmm. I will answer my phone again in an hour. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you still wanna contact me and you can calm down and have a conversation mm -hmm. with me, then, one hour from now at one o'clock, I will answer my phone after that time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes too, just along with that, is having a person to call to say, I just had to say this to them, please hold me accountable, mm -hmm. don't let me answer the phone, because sometimes it's really, really hard, yeah. especially when we're the type of people that just want to help and we yeah. just want to be there and be with them and for them and all the things, but we can't, we also, that emotional abuse, which is what it is, weighs on you too, mm -hmm. and it will eventually start to destroy you, and you will not be able to help that person if you are not well yourself. Mm -hmm. There's a sentence that I say that goes right with this, which <coughs> I, I say most days, when I'm not saying what part of this is okay and what part is not okay, the other thing I say is what part of this is in my control and which part of this is not in my control, and I list it out, um, because most of the time I'm upset with the things that are not actually in my control, mm -hmm. and so, in this scenario she just described, she's not in control of somebody else's tone or voice or the language that they use or how much they yell. She is in control of whether she picks up the phone or not. Mm -hmm. And so she can focus on, I can, I can decide to answer the phone and listen, or I can decide to say I'm not gonna answer the phone and I won't listen. And then she gets help to support in the decision that she said, I have to stick with the thing that I'm in control of I, and I also love the word you used earlier. You said surrender. Like, as surrender the, some, to God the things that are not actually in my control, rather than doubling down my efforts mm. to manage the thing that I, is not actually in my control. Me listing it out, I'm a list guy, me listing it out helps me stay focused mm -hmm. on the things in this, in this mess that I'm dealing with today. What part of it can I actually do something about? And what do I need to surrender and let go of because it's not actually in my control. Mm. Thank you. You can hold on to that. Well, they will be up here afterwards. I know that time went by really quick, but I want to be sensitive to our children's workers. 
who have been downstairs, and uh, I want to make sure we wrap things up. But they'll be up here for a few minutes. People want to chat with them. Um, if you have other questions, you can always email, call us at church. We'll do everything we have. We have lots of resources. Remember, there's the resource pack on the back. We also have digital versions of that. Uh, we want to be here to help you. And uh, any way we can do that, uh, we'd like to. So let me pray, and we'll be just